You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Good morning. Matthew chapter 5 is where we are in our study of God's Word this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we are making our way through the Gospel of Matthew these days, and we have made our way to the fifth chapter, and this morning have come to verses 33 through 37. Matthew chapter 5. We read beginning at verse 33. This is in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. Our Lord is preaching and this is what he said. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Let's go to our God together in prayer and ask His blessing. It's a joy, Lord, to gather together with brothers and sisters. Every Lord's Day is a joy to our hearts as we gather with the church. Lord, we give you praise and thanks for what you're doing in our lives, individually and together. You have made us your own, and every day that we're alive, we we see your faithfulness, your kindness, your patience, your love, your generosity to us. A, A perfect Father who corrects us when we sin and brings us afresh and anew to repentance and continues to, to guide us and shepherd us in such a way that our feet stay on a safe path. This is your doing, and our hearts are full as we consider this, and and we give you praise for what you're doing with us together. Lord, we see your work in the midst of this church, and we continue, Lord, even to think about the day when a new church will be planted in Katy, and all that you're doing there. Lord, in in all of this, we we stand before you with grateful hearts and, and in awe of your power and your working. We come now, Lord, to these verses, and we ask that you'd be our teacher. Lord, the the weakness of the vessel who preaches is apparent to all, and especially, Lord, to me. And I just pray that you would help me this morning, that you would grant me a clear mind and clear expression of the things that you've taught me and are on my heart and mind today as I come to these verses. Help me, Lord, to be faithful to your word, to say nothing that would be displeasing to you. And be at work in our hearts so that we can receive these things. Lord, you are our teacher. If you don't teach us, we don't learn. And so we ask you to to do that work in our hearts. And together we will give you praise and thanks for that. And Lord, we also pray for those hearing me today who don't know Christ. And we continue to long for and rejoice in salvation as we see you gather in your son's flock as one soul at a time, people come to, to the knowledge of Christ through the preaching of the gospel. May you save even today. We ask for all this today in the name of our Savior and King, our Shepherd, Jesus, in his name. Amen. Sooner or later, you come to a passage of Scripture that can seem a bit confusing to you if you just look at it at its you know, at face value, if you just read it the first time, it seems to be saying something 
that is in conflict with some other portion of Scripture. When that happens, your, your doctrine of Scripture is very important. If you know the truth, if you know what Jesus has said about the Bible, that it's true down to the, the smallest stroke, down to the smallest letter, then you know that Scripture is consistent with itself. When you come to something that seems to be in contradiction with some other portion of Scripture, what do you do? You go to work synthesizing everything the Bible teaches on that subject to resolve the apparent contradiction. You don't, you're not playing games with Scripture. It's not some artificial thing you're doing. You're just faithfully taking into your mind and heart everything the Bible teaches on that subject. And sooner or later, what tends to happen is uh, there's clarity. You, you begin to understand exactly what this passage means in light of a larger context. Well, that's what's going on as we come to these verses this morning. Our Lord is saying something in the Sermon on the Mount that seems uh, at face value to be in conflict with some other portion of Scripture. Uh, remember, Jesus said He did not come uh, to be in conflict with the Old Testament law or the prophets. He came to fulfill them didn't come to uh, destroy them, but to fulfill them. So he's already said he's not in conflict with the Old Testament, which makes us wonder when he says in verse 34, I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven or by the earth or by Jerusalem or by your head, the color of hairs on your head. Don't take an oath at all. It makes you wonder because you know there are other portions of Scripture where oath-taking, vow-making is appropriate. And you, you take what Christ says here and what we heard in our Scripture reading this morning. Maybe I should say what we read in our Scripture reading this morning because we heard it in Spanish. Some of you were able to track. I was reading. <laughs> but what we saw was that in the book of James, you find the very same statement. Don't take an oath at all. So how, how do these things fit together? Well, I believe we'll see this morning when you read these verses carefully and in the larger context, you, you begin to understand that what Jesus is talking about is the misuse of vows. It has to do with when a vow was taken, how a vow was taken. He's talking about the misuse of vows. And I, and I, and I think when he says don't take a vow at all, or to swear an oath at all, he's talking about your common conversation. He's not talking about the special occasions when a vow would be appropriate. He's talking about how you communicate normally. And I'll explain as we move on this morning into the sermon. But even then, when you understand that Jesus is talking about the misuse of vows, if all you're thinking about are vows and oaths, I think you've really missed the point. Because though he's talking about vows and oaths, what he's really talking about is, is that which has to do with vow-making or oath-taking. That is truthfulness. What Christ is talking about in these verses is our attitude about truthfulness. Remember that throughout this sermon, you have a contrast taking place. In fact, in this portion of the sermon, there are six examples that Jesus gives where he contrasts the false righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, a righteousness that is damning, a righteousness that doesn't represent salvation. He contrasts that with the righteousness that God produces in a people whom he saves. The kind of righteousness you need to stand before God accepted, that, that righteousness has to be given to you as a gift. That's justification by faith in Christ. But, but after saving a people, God goes to work in our lives, producing in us his own character. What kind of righteousness is that? Well, it's not like that of the scribes and Pharisees. It's something different. And Jesus gives six examples where this difference becomes apparent. And, and it had to do with how they read the law of God and how they applied the law of God. When God saves a people, he opens their eyes to be able to see the truth as it is in the Scriptures. So even our reading of the Scriptures and our application of the Scriptures has changed since the Lord saved us. How many here this morning could say, now the Bible is an open book to you, where before it was closed? 
So, so this is what Christ is doing. He's giving us these contrasts. And in this particular case, what he's telling us is that true righteousness, saving righteousness, is concerned with the truth. True righteousness is not characterized by dishonesty. True righteousness is not characterized by insincerity. True righteousness hates manipulative communication. True righteousness is not characterized by guile, that, that is, hidden motives. Right? You say one thing, but there's really something standing behind what you're saying that isn't exactly what you're saying. That's not what characterizes true righteousness. True righteousness does not engage in deceptive, manipulative, pseudo-spiritual word games. That's what I want to talk about this morning, ungodly word games. And the reason why true righteousness is not characterized by this is because it reverences God. See, once again, we're talking about heart issues. When you talk about murder, you're really talking about a heart issue. When you talk about adultery, you're really talking about a heart issue. Even when you talk about divorce, as we touched on last Sunday evening, you're talking about a heart issue. And so it is with swearing an oath. So it is with making a vow. You're really talking about a heart issue. Psalm 15 makes this so clear. A Psalm of David O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Speaks truth in his heart. Who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. And then it says this, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. That is, this is someone who keeps his vows. This is someone who keeps his oaths. But do you notice, before it says he swears to his own hurt and does not change, it describes this person as someone who speaks the truth in his heart. The reason why his vows matter to him is because he's a truth speaker in his heart. He is someone who reverences God. So when you get a hold of that principle, you begin to see that the issue here is more than just when and how we should take a vow. The issue is how do godly people communicate with each other? We don't play word games. We tell the truth. We are a people characterized by sincerity. I think about this often. Jesus warned his disciples, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Do you remember what the leaven of the Pharisees is? What is it? Hypocrisy. The leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. What does it mean to be a hypocrite? It means you wear a mask. It means what you see is not what you get. It means there's a facade, there's a face, there's a veneer. There, there's what you present, but there's something else you see behind what you present. That's not what characterizes righteousness. True righteousness is characterized by the truth. So as we've done before, we're going to cover this this morning uh, in a few, just, just three points. I'll give them to you as we come to them. But here's the first one. What the people had been taught, what the people had been taught. Verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said. I've already explained this, but I just remind you, when Jesus says you've heard that it was said, he's talking about how the scribes and Pharisees had taught the law of God based on years and years and years of rabbinical tradition and interpretation. So, so that's why he, he says it that way. You've heard that it was said. This is what you've been taught. You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, 
for it is the throne of God or by the earth, for it is his footstool or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Now, before we get into the details of what they had, what, what characterized the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees in Christ's day around the topic of oaths and vows, before we get into the details, I just want to make one general observation. This, this 10,000 foot view, it covers everything we'll talk about this morning. Remember that what the scribes and Pharisees had done with all of their teaching is they had made room for common sins in their religious system. They had a way of excusing sin. They had a way of exonerating themselves. And they did that by the way they read the law and the prophets and the way they applied it. They made room in their religious system for common sins. We saw it when Christ talked about murder. They, they talked about murdering people physically, but they never dealt with the heart issue, which is anger. And so there was a way to make room for sinful anger. They talked about adultery, but they didn't talk about what goes on in the heart. And so they made room for sexual immorality that would take place in the thoughts and in the hearts of people. They talked about making sure you didn't violate the law of God with respect to divorce, but they didn't really focus on what God said about marriage. And so they had a way of diminishing the importance of marriage, the sanctity of marriage, even as in the name of keeping the law of God about, about divorce. And so it is here that they made room in the way they dealt with vows and oaths in the name of keeping the law of God, what they didn't emphasize what they made room for was the absence of truth-telling, a disregard for telling the truth. Now think about it. All of those things we've just mentioned are common sins. This is what characterizes lost humanity, sinful anger, sexual immorality, disregard for the sanctity of marriage, and disregard for the truth. This is just the world around you. I, I want you to remember this. Worldly religion is always just worldliness. It, it's worldliness with a religious twist, but it's just worldliness. It's no different. It's no better. It's no more sanctified. It's no more sanitized than the sins around you. It's just been put into the religious realm. It is the, the domain of darkness operating in the name of God. It is worldliness. And so what happens when you talk about worldly religion is there is space made for what men and women want to do, but now we, we, we sanitize it. We, we make it something religious in nature by the way that we work it out in our system. We, we ought to know about this because we live in the same world they lived in with respect to sin. The world doesn't change. We live in a world where men and women hate each other. Uh, can, I, can I claim to worship God and still hate my neighbor? Can I claim to worship God and still hate my brother? Is there a way we can build that into our religious system where we can somehow explain it away and, and justify my anger? We, we live in a world with an explosion of sexual immorality all around us. We live in a world where the, the nuclear family is, is imploding, where marriages are breaking down and divorce is no longer considered to be a serious offense in the eyes of God. We live in a world where, where truth is thought to be determined by the individual. The truth is whatever you say it is. And in fact, there's not even, there's not even much concern about, about whether or not your truth claims are consistent with each other. You can claim to be holding on to the truth in one area and holding on to the truth in another area, and the two things you hold on to are absolutely opposed to each other, but nobody has the right to ask you how they can both be true at the same time. We've gotten a taste of this, haven't we, when, when there's a segment of our culture that wants to argue for 
the murder of babies in the womb in the name of bodily autonomy. Nobody has a right to tell me what to do with my body. On the other hand, we have the right to impose vaccinations on you <laughs> no matter what you want to do with your body. So, so never mind asking us how those two things can agree with each other. It doesn't matter. They're both true. They're both true if you just listen to us. We live in a world where lying is not a big deal at all as long as you are lying for, the, for a good reason. Uh, what I've just talked about is politics. So, so we get lied to all the time, but politicians do it with, without any kind of blush uh, in their face because as far as they're concerned, they're just lying to you to take care of you. They're lying to you for a good reason, to accomplish something good. So lying is okay. Well, you take all those sins in the world, and what happens with worldly religion is those same sins show up in our system. We've just, we've just made a place for them. We have somehow worked those things out. Well, that's what the scribes and Pharisees had done. The first two examples we saw involved their teaching not going far enough. So we say what the Bible says about murder, but we never get to the heart implications. We say what the Bible says about adultery, but we don't deal with it at a heart level. So their teaching was deficient based on what it ignored, what it left out, where it stopped. The next two examples involve a distortion of righteousness by reduction and by addition. Right? By reduction, when it came to the divorce issue, the scribes and Pharisees focused on the concession, but, but didn't focus on the design, which is why Jesus takes them beyond the Mosaic concession all the way back to the book of Genesis and talks about marriage as God originally designed it. And makes the point, as we'll see in Matthew 19 when we get there, that the concession really was a reflection of the hardness of human hearts. But they didn't focus on that. They focused on the concession. So, so distorting righteousness by reduction, by reducing God's Word, ignoring portions of it, and emphasizing one above the other in the interest of what they wanted to accomplish. This is an example of distortion by addition. So they took what the law of God had to say about vows and oaths, and they then began to extrapolate from it this elaborate system where you could determine how liable someone was or how exempt they were from what they promised based on what they were swearing by. Notice what Jesus says, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Okay, what is that? That is a faithful summary of what the Old Testament taught about vows and oaths. The scribes and Pharisees said what the Bible said about it. Uh, on one level. Exodus chapter 20 verse 7 says this, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Leviticus 19.12 says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Numbers 30 verse 2 says, If a man vows a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Deuteronomy 23 verse 21 says, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips, for you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. Right? All those verses say the same thing, which is keep your vows. What comes out of your mouth God witnesses it. What comes out of your mouth, God cares about. You're, you're now bound by His authority to fulfill what you have promised.
promise. Well, notice that's the summary that Jesus gives in verse 33, the summary of the teaching that the people had heard. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. So far, so good. That is what the Bible said. By the way, by what the Bible said, two things really stand out that, that people were not to miss and that we must not miss. Taking an oath was serious. Don't, don't take an oath, right? The, the passage we, we read in Deuteronomy said, if you choose not to take an oath and you don't perform it, then it's not sin. But if, but if you take an oath, if what passes out of your lips is a promise, a pledge, you're now bound to keep it. Psalm 15, we read it earlier. He, uh, what kind of person is a righteous person? Someone who swears to his own hurt and does not change. That is, you keep your commitments. You make a commitment. Now you find out it's difficult to fulfill it. You don't back out of it just because it's difficult. You finish it. You fulfill it. By the way, there was a time when parents taught their children this. I don't know about you, but if I begged my dad to start something and he let me do it, and then halfway through I wanted to quit, you know what the answer was, right? You're going to finish it. You're going to finish it. You don't start things, son, and you don't finish it. What is that? That's teaching your children something about integrity, something about keeping your commitments, keeping your word. But something else that, that was equally important not only are we to take oaths seriously, but every oath we take is in God's name. You see, we're making... Pro what, what, let's take one step back. What is an oath? It is a pledge. It is a promise in the name of God. It is when you promise to do something or you promise not to do something in the name of God. It is when you say, I'm telling the truth. So it's just a pledge of truthfulness in some cases. We, we see this in the court of law. People put their hand on the Bible and they swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. God help me, right? In the name of God, I'm pledging to tell the truth. And, and by, by invoking the name of God, what you're saying is this, if I break my word, then God's punishment upon me will be absolutely just he will be right to punish me because I've made a promise. Well, every promise that you've ever made in the name of God is, is about His authority. You're responsible to Him for those oaths. That's what the Bible teaches us about this subject. So, so don't take oaths lightly. Take them seriously and realize you're taking them in the name of God. Why do oaths exist? Why is this even a thing? Why do people do this? I think you know the answer. Because of man's propensity to lie. We live in a world full of lies. People lie. Man by nature is a liar. I mean from birth. In fact, this is why we're told in Scripture that no liar will be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Liars have their place in hell. This is what characterizes lost humanity, dishonesty, deceitfulness, lying. So God made a way on rare occasions, on special occasions for, for men and women to make promises, to give vows, to, to take an oath whereby they would be making this statement, I am aware that what I'm saying right now is weighty. I want you to know that I know that God knows that I'm responsible for what I'm saying here. It was a way for you to affirm your truthfulness to say, I'm not just, I'm not just passing by these words swiftly. I'm not taking these words lightly. I am fully conscious of what I'm saying, and I am promising you that I will do this or not do this or that what I'm saying is the truth. So one of the purposes for an oath was to let the hearers know that you were aware of your responsibility before God. And at the same time, what that would do is impart an assurance to the hearer that you would keep your word. And God allowed for this 
In fact, not only did he allow for it, in some cases he encouraged it. Because we live in such a world of lies that on special, rare occasions, with great weightiness, knowing that what we were doing was in his name, here's a way for me to say, I'm giving thought to these words, and you should be assured that I'm telling the truth. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20 says this, You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name you shall swear. Deuteronomy 6.13 says, It is the Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Right? Men in general swear by all sorts of things. I mean, this is something not just found where you have... Uh, you know, in the Old Testament times, the people of God, New Testament times, the church. This is not just something you find among God's people. You find it in the world at large. People are promising things all the time, swearing by all sorts of things. You've heard things like, I swear on my mother's grave, right? Uh, May God strike me dead. It's really a kind of a frightening thing for someone to say, isn't it? But this is, this is, this is, these are the sorts of things you hear just in the culture at large. Men are, by nature, liars, and as a result, they know that sometimes they need to really ramp up their language for you to know that they're telling the truth. Well, God is saying, look, that isn't to go on in the name of Baal. That isn't to go on in the name of this or that. This is, it is by my name that you shall swear. This is going to be the mark that you know me, believe me, reverence me, fear me, that when you take an oath, you realize you're taking it in my name. In fact, this would mark the conversion of the nations. Jeremiah 12 verse 16 says, and it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, Then they shall be built up in the midst of my people. How would you know that the nations actually came to a true saving faith in Yahweh? They would no longer be teaching people to swear in the name of Baal. They would be teaching people, it is to God, the God of the Bible, that we're responsible for our promises, for our words. And so there were times that swearing an oath was appropriate. That's why I said when you hear Christ's words in context, he's not eliminating all oath-taking, Okay, we didn't violate Scripture last Sunday night when, when there were promises made in this auditorium and two people were married right, right in our midst. We weren't violating Scripture when they made vows, when they made promises. That's not what Jesus is saying. As we'll see in a moment, he's talking about the misuse of this practice. Indeed, God himself swore an oath. Hebrews 6.13, For when God made a promise to Abraham... Since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. Our Lord practiced a form of this often in his public ministry when he would say, Truly, truly, I say to you. Truly, truly, I say to you. When God swore an oath by himself, God was not implying that he cannot always be trusted. God always tells the truth. When Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, he wasn't saying, now, now, really pay attention here because you can't always trust me, but on this one you can trust me. That's not what he was saying. You see, sometimes an oath, an oath was not meant to imply, I don't tell the truth all the time. An oath was meant to emphasize the importance of a statement, to emphasize the weightiness of a statement. That's what God is doing in Hebrews 6. That's what what Jesus was doing in his public ministry. This is what Paul would do. How did Paul understand the words of Jesus? Well, he he must not have understood these words to to eliminate all oath-taking, all vow-making, because, listen to 2 Corinthians 11.31, The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. What has he just done? He has called God into the room, as it were. God knows I'm not lying. Galatians 1.20, 
In what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Paul says, in the sight of God, in the presence of God, I'm telling you the truth. What is that? That's a form of oath-taking. Romans 1.9 says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you. God is my witness that I pray for you all the time, Paul writes to the Romans. So, what is Jesus taking issue with? I think you get a, a sense of it, don't you? When he begins to mention all these other things. Do not take an oath by heaven. Do not take an oath by earth. Do not take an oath by Jerusalem. Do not take an oath by your head, the hair on your head. <laughs> Lord, why are you mentioning all of these things? Because of what the scribes and Pharisees had done with what the Bible said about oaths and vows. What had they done? As I said earlier, they had developed this elaborate system of greater guilt or lesser guilt if you violate your word based on what you promised by. If you promised by one thing, you were bound. If you promised by another thing, less important. So that what was intended to emphasize truthfulness and weightiness became a way to deceive people. Oh, you thought I really meant that, but have you forgotten? I didn't swear by the temple. I swore by the gold on the temple. Have you forgotten? I didn't swear by this. I swore by that. So I, I just couldn't keep it, and, and, and I'm okay because I didn't swear by, by this. I swore by that. By the way, we don't need uh, th this week. Have you heard of the Mishnah? So, so what, what is the Mishnah? It, it, it is a compilation, a codification of, of oral tradition, the, the teaching of the rabbis beginning at, at about the time of Ezra 450 B.C. to, to the 3rd century when it came in, into, into print. Right? It went from oral tradition to on paper. But it's this compilation, this codification of all these, these oral teachings, commentary on the Pentateuch by the rabbis. And I read this week the section in the Mishnah on oaths. Uh, you, you can find it, you know, Google it if you're interested in it. I, I can tell you this, it is, it is tiring. It is tiring to read. Uh, they, they broke it down into two kinds of, of, of oath-taking, and then you had four subsections, and then you had issue after issue after issue after issue, and the question was always, are they liable or are they exempt? And there, and there was debate among the rabbis about, well, I, I think they're liable on this one. No, I think they're exempt on that one. And this is the sort of thing that was going on at the time of Christ. But you don't need extra biblical information to know that. Jesus tells us this was going on. Matthew 23, verse 16. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Huh. You fools. Don't you understand that as you're trying to, to make this distinction between what you swore by and what you didn't, don't you understand, and here's Christ's point 
in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't you understand that you can't swear by anything that doesn't belong to God? Whatever you would swear by exists because of God, is sustained by God, and belongs to God. No matter what comes out of your mouth as you swear by something greater than yourself, you're swearing by something that has an attachment to Almighty God, which means you're swearing by Him. You're responsible to Him. You're accountable to Him. That's what our Lord says here. I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God. Don't you know you're talking about God's throne when you talk about heaven? Or if you swear by the earth, don't you know that's His footstool? Or if you talk about Jerusalem, don't you know that's the, 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 the city of the, uh, of the divine king? Or what about your head, whether your hair is white or black? Or don't, don't you know you belong to God? Don't you know you have no control of that whatsoever? You can't swear by anything and not be responsible to God. So this is what they were hearing, that oaths, extrapolated out, oath-taking, you had greater responsibility, lesser responsibility, based on what you were swearing by. Now, second point this morning, what had the teaching distorted? This is what the people have been taught. What had the teaching distorted? What they missed, of course, is the responsibility of God's people to always communicate truthfully. Do, am I only responsible to tell the truth when I swear an oath? Do I have to say, I promise to be trustworthy? Or am I to be truthful all the time? And what else the teaching had distorted was that the thought that if I say, if, if I swear by one thing, I'm not really accountable to God. But if I swear by another thing, now I'm accountable to God. Do you understand that you're accountable to God for every word you speak? You're responsible to be truthful all the time, and you're responsible for your words before Almighty God, no matter what you say, under an oath or not, under a vow or not. You're responsible to God. This is what the teaching had distorted. What was meant to be confined to rare, special circumstances had become an everyday word game. You only swear an oath on special occasions, not casting doubt on your truthfulness, but emphasizing truthfulness and emphasizing the weightiness of it. What was meant to be rare and always in the name of God had become everyday speech with no regard for God, and in fact, became a tool for deception. You had to always be asking, now, what did he just swear by? I wonder if he's telling me the truth or not. What our Lord is saying is every word you speak is as binding as an oath. Every word you speak is as binding as if you were taking an oath. You are always responsible to tell the truth. Stop compartmentalizing holiness. And again, this is what characterizes sinful, lost human beings, isn't it? That they compartmentalize holiness. I just love going into a cathedral because it just feels so holy, <laughs> someone says. Now look, we can love great architecture. I'm not criticizing that. But the idea that you walk into a place and it's holy and you walk outside of that place and it's not is wrong thinking. I would never use profanity in the church. <laughs> I'll say something in common conversation that I wouldn't say in the church. I sometimes want to ask people, as you're justifying your language, can I use that in my sermon Sunday? Can I just say what you just said? And if not, maybe there's something wrong with what you just said. Excuse me, pastor, I didn't know you were standing there. 
I've gotten that one a lot through the years. As if I'm holier than they are by nature, which I'm not. As if pastors have never heard that language in their, in their entire lives, right? Never heard that one before. But this is what we do. We compartmentalize holiness. And this is what happens with vow-taking, promise-making, oath-swearing, is you begin to say, this is, these are words that matter. These are words for which I'm accountable. No, every word matters, and you're accountable for every word. That's what our Lord is saying. Because true righteousness cares about truth. You see? He speaks truth in his heart. Which is why his promises matter. Third point, final point. So what does the truth then require of us? What our Lord is teaching here, what does it require of us? But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Away with the wicked word games in your common everyday speech. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. How do we live? What does true righteousness insist on? What characterizes salvation's righteousness? Sincerity. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Get rid of the mask. Get rid of the veneer. Mean what you say. Say what you mean. Sincerity, truthfulness, genuineness, nothing fake, no facade. And by the way, you always have to say this for a certain segment of people. Not being fake doesn't mean saying everything that enters your head. <laughs> he's really real. No, he's really rude. <laughs> But there's a difference, isn't there, between being polite and kind, mannerly, and trying to present something that just isn't the case. The mask needs to be removed. Our Lord says this, for, it, for, for, for anything more than this, verse 37, comes from evil. I think that's the key right there. No hidden motives behind our words. No evil behind our words that you don't see, that you don't hear, but it's there. This is what happens when, you, when it's not yes and no, when it becomes, you know, piling up the things you're swearing by. You're trying to convince someone of your truthfulness when you mean something else. Vows belong to extraordinary circumstances, always in the name of God, but ordinary circumstances and ordinary conversations are also in the name of God. So that Christ is teaching us that righteous people do not have evil behind their conversations. They are not playing wicked word games. In sincerity marks wicked people. Insincere communication marks wicked people. Proverbs 6 verse 12 says, a worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger. We've all seen it, haven't we? Someone communicating with a person, having a conversation face-to-face -face with them, your, your buddy's over here, having a conversation with this person. As far as they're concerned, you're absolutely fine with them having an enjoyable conversation. They don't know any 
different. They look away for a moment. You look over to your buddy and you kind of make a face. What's going on? There's something going on in the conversation. This person doesn't know, but you and your buddy know. What, what is that? That's, that's, that's wicked. That's what that is. That's sin. But this is what characterizes the communication of wicked people. They wink with their eye. They shuffle with their feet. And they body language, point with their finger. Something's, something more is there than what they're saying. Goes on to say, with perverted heart devises evil, continually sowing discord. You can mark this. Not only are wicked people marked by insincere communication, they are troublemakers. They sow discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. That doesn't just happen by itself, dear ones. That's, that is the character of Almighty God functioning in the moral realm of His creatures. Yet you reap what you sow, but the reason that law holds true is because of the law giver. He punishes evil. He hates insincere communication. He hates the veneer. He hates the mask. He hates the fakeness. He hates the facade. There's another expression of this, though, isn't there? There's not like making fun of people. That's not like the only expression of this. Sometimes it can happen when you're really nice to someone. It's called flattery. Nice because in some way it benefits you. Nice because of what you're, you're going to get in return, which means it's false. It's not sincere. Psalm 12, verse 1, O Lord, Save, O Lord, save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone, for the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Don't miss that. Do you know what's, what goes on with deceptive communication? Is you really be believe that you're a master over your circumstances. And that you have no accountability for what's coming out of your mouth. You are manipulating situations. Sometimes through flattery, sometimes through hidden motives, but you are the master of your tongue and you are making your way. You are, you are bla blazing a pathway for yourself with your mouth. Who is master over me? To whom will I give an account? I'm going to make my way by what I say. It is rebellion against God. It's wicked. And so if we take our Lord's words to heart, let your yes be yes, your no, no, anything beyond this is evil. You understand every word I speak is important and every word I speak is accountable to God. Therefore, every word should be truthful and sincere. Let it be real. And this is what marks salvation. We knew what it was in our lost condition to live like that. We knew what it was to be insincere and fake and wear a mask and influence, you know, schmooze people and influence. This is what belongs to lost humanity. Don't make a place for it in your religious system. Go to the truth of God's word and kill it because it's evil. Let the Lord change your life in this area. John 1 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. What a commentary from the Lord of glory about another person, about a, a, a sinful human being. To say of Nathaniel, there's someone who is an Israelite indeed. What does that mean? He's saved. He's a true Israelite. And now what characterizes Nathaniel? He's someone who is guileless. He's genuine. He's real. He's sincere. He's honest. He's truthful. Psalm 32 verse 2 says, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
in whose spirit there is no deceit. He speaks truth in his heart. Psalm 24, verse 3, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. True righteousness cares about the truth. It's a heart issue. We speak truth in our hearts, and therefore our communication is not manipulation. Our communication is not veneer. It's not a facade. It's not a face. It's genuine. It's real. It's truthful. You do know that only Christ produces such a people. Only Christ changes hearts to love the truth. Has he changed your heart? Do you know Christ? My final thought this morning would be this. Who do you think this sermon is about? What do we usually do when we hear a sermon like this? We think about someone else. We think about someone else. Can I tell you something? This sermon is for me. This sermon is for you. Draw a circle around your life. It's for you. Kent Hughes said this, What can we personally do to promote Jesus' call to radical truthfulness? Remember that for Jesus, words were sacramental, for they were outward signs of an inward condition. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. We need a truthful spirit that brings forth an increasing veracity of speech. We also need to remember that our Lord hears every word, not just the oaths. And that we will give account of all our words. And then he says this, I thought this was beautiful. He says, our words are freighted with eternity. Our words are freighted with eternity. What I think he means is our words carry eternal significance. Our words carry eternal responsibility. Samuel Johnson said this, it is more from carelessness about truth than from intentional lying that there's so much falsehood in the world. Why is there so much falsehood in the world? Not because people are setting out to lie to each other in most of the cases, but because we're just not very careful with the truth. We just don't care enough about the truth. One of the greatest evidences that the Lord has saved you is now you recognize lies. You recognize even the polite ones. And the Lord smites your heart with the knowledge of your own insincerity. And you can't live like that. Oh, that the Lord would give us a church full of Nathaniels. Truly saved people in whom there is no guile. What you see is what is. We can all pray, can we not? Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. And the church would say, Amen. let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your saving work in us that makes us care about the truth. Would you, Lord... Be at work in each of our lives, beginning with me, everyone who's hearing me. Removing the dross from us so that we know what it is to, to be genuine. Let us be that man, woman described in Psalm 15 who speaks the truth in our heart, who swears to our own hurt and we do not change. We know, Lord, that this can only be produced
by the saving power and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So may you save and may you produce sincerity in those whom you save. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.